once again be reminded that this life is about you. Would you allow us to put everything that would hinder us from focusing on you out of our minds, out of our hearts, and help us to do just that, focus on you and you alone. We'll thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, the one who is the Messiah, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to part three of our series, Big Church. Becoming the church that God wants us to be in the modern world. I, I want to just clarify something for you, if I can, that when, when I say that subtitle, Becoming the Church that God Wants in the Modern World, we are not looking to become the hippest, the coolest, the flashiest. What we are looking to be is a, an effective church that can affect effectively through the power of the Holy Spirit reach people who do not know Jesus and do what the Bible told us to do. You know what the Bible told us to do as Christians, as followers of Christ, to make other disciples. That's our goal. Jesus said, "Go and make disciples." Now, in part three, we are going to talk about responsibility. We live in a world in a culture, whenever something happens, the first question that is asked is this, well, who's responsible for this? And nobody wants to take responsibility, unless, of course, it's something good. And then everybody takes responsibility. Everybody wants to take responsibility. Well, here's the neat thing about how God set up his church. Okay, the power comes from him to do what we have been called to do. But the neat thing is that we know that we do not have to do this alone. We have been called as a body of believers, as a family. There's so many descriptive words that are used in scripture to together and individually. Individually, we all do what we've been called to do, and corporately, this comes from God, but it also comes from us being willing to take the responsibility for what God has called us to do. There is no such thing as a sideline follower of Christ. We have all, all, I looked up the Greek for the word all, we have all been called to be responsible for proclaiming and fulfilling the call of Christ. Now we're not going to focus on this passage that, I, that I'm going to mention now today, but I encourage you to go home and, and look it up and read it. But the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul, the Apostle Paul, does an incredible job of describing the body of Christ as a body. That we are all different parts of the body that have been called to accomplish different things. Now, some of you may have been called to be a part of the body that you don't like. Well, there's a reason God called you to be that part. Because you are the only one that can do it. We are all different in our calling, but we are all necessary. I want you to hear this and, and, and do not miss this. responsibility of Christ and there is no lesser job in the responsibility of Christ if you have for someone that calling is just as important as my job to stand up here every week 
and to teach. Did you get that? That is really good preaching. You need to write that down. <laughs> In fact, last year we lost a, a dear member of our church, um, Gladys Blessed. And um, she, she lived in the apartments next door to the church, or right on the other side of the, of the parsonage. And um, for some reason, I always seemed to be holding the door for her when she would come up to a Wednesday night service or something. And, and she would in the ministry. And I used to say to her, Gladys, you don't understand. That is the least stressful. Difference in the call. We all are different parts. And Paul goes to great lengths to describe that. But we are equally important. Um, recently, we did some purging at my house. Now, for those of you that know the makeup of our home, purging is a regular occurrence. <laughs> In fact, if you walk into our front room, you will notice that there is a space set aside and many people will say, what is that stuff there for? And Karen will say, well, that's just stuff we're getting rid of. <laughs> she had somebody at, at, at her job recently at the credit union ask her about that, and she was bringing some boxes home to get rid of some stuff, and the person said, wait a minute, you mean you get rid of stuff? <laughs> well, I would hate to see this person's house, but yes, we do. So in the, in the purging process, I am often... I'm trying not to get myself in trouble here. I don't know how I'll get under. I am encouraged to do the same thing. Okay, so there was a section in one closet that I have some some uh, stuff that that uh, is near and dear to my heart, and so I told Karen that I would go through and purge it. And I came across some interesting things. Um, one of the things that I came across. Actually, I found three of these, and these all came from my, my mom. Um, anybody ever be, remember being given a little New Testament as a child? Um, yeah. Well, um, my, my niece lived with us um, when she was a baby for um, a little bit of time, and uh, she's 10 years younger than me. And I found this New Testament in my purging efforts, and I'm going to um, mail it to her this week. By the way, if, if Misty, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, this is coming to you. But um, this was given to her as a child. Now, she only lived with us for a short period of time, but she has shared to me on several occasions how... A young child praying for her led her as an adult to become a follower of Christ. And she now lives in Ohio. Now, why do I tell you that? I tell you that because somebody in a Sunday school class somewhere that people thought didn't mean anything gave her this New Testament and prayed for her. And years later, somebody else harvested the seed that was planted decades before. Right. You see, there is no distinction in our jobs in the cause of Christ. But let me tell you where there is a distinction. The distinction is, if one part of the body is not fulfilling their calling... The rest of the body hurts. That's right. Did you hear that? We have all been called to fulfill our calling. So if one part of the body is um, not doing what they're supposed to, there's going to be a weakness. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. We're involved in it, laughed about it. Okay, so it's not me laughing at them. They laughed about it. So our, uh, our brother-in-law, Greg, um, 
Karen's sister's husband. Many of you know we prayed for him last year. Um, he had some very difficult uh, health issues and ended up having to have part of his right leg amputated. Um, and he's doing fine now. His body's healing, and 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 they are they are recovering through the grace of God um, with this. Well, back at Christmas, they made their first attempt to come to our house for Christmas dinner. And we had thought up this whole plan of how to get him in the house, but he had his own idea. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip all of the details and just say that that when when he went to try to get up from where he was to get back in his wheelchair, his natural instincts kicked in, and guess what he tried to do? He tried to push up with his right foot. Did, did you get that? His right foot wasn't there. Now, he, he and his wife laughed about that. Karen and I were like, should we laugh about this? And they're like, no, it's funny, laugh about it. It happens all the time. What, what an attitude, right? But, but here's the deal. Something was missing. Something was not functioning like it was supposed to be because it was not there. And so the rest of the body had to compensate. You get what I'm saying? That, that when we have been given a responsibility for the cause of Christ and we are lax in that responsibility or we do not give it our all, then the rest of the body has to pick up and has to, to compensate for that. And that brings me to this thought, that if God has given you, not if, God has given you a responsibility. And when he gives you responsibility, you know what your responsibility is? To do it with everything that's within you and to do it in such a way that it will bring honor and glory to him. Now, you, none of us are perfect, so we're not going to do things every always to perfection. Pastor Jay made a comment a few minutes ago about me so eloquently saying something. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you heard me eloquently say anything? <laughs> no amens, please. We have been called to do what God has called us to do to the best of our ability to give it our all and, and so that he will receive the glory and the honor, not us. That's what we have been called to do. So today, let's talk about sharing the responsibilities of our church. If we are going to be all that God has called us to be, then we all have to figure out what our responsibility is. That means seeking God's face. Seeking his word, figuring out how he's gifted us, how he's blessed us, what he has given us a heart for. And then to accept that call and to do it with everything that's within us. And not to just do it like, well, I'll just do the best I can. So you mean to tell me you're only going to give God the best you can. You're not going to give him any extra effort. God believes in personal responsibility. He absolutely does. And he's asking us to do that. So, how can you share in the responsibilities of your church? If we're going to be the church that God wants in this modern world in which we live, which I, I will tell you it is becoming harder and harder, more difficult and more difficult to reach people. There are so many things pulling people away from church, so many things pulling people away from worshiping, it's becoming more and more difficult. But God's not done with us. He's got a plan. So how can we do that? Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. The way you can share the responsibility of your church is by praying for its health and its growth. Okay, how can you be responsible for your church. Last week I said the greatest thing you can do for me as your pastor is to pray for me. The greatest thing you can do for your church is to pray for one another. Before I elaborate on this eloquently, thank you, um, let's turn to scripture. First of all, I want to tell you that the, the, 
many or most of the letters written in the New Testament were written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, and they were written to churches that he started. He wrote those letters to give them instruction, to give them correction, and to give them encouragement. Now, those letters were written to those churches, but by extension, they are written to us as well. So when we read 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, when we read those books, we have to understand that those are words from God to us as a church how we should function. So let's talk about praying for our church. I'm going to give you just three, three passages here. First of all, 1 Thessalonians, again, a letter to a church. Paul says, we are writing to the church in Thessalonica, to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give you grace and peace. We always thank God for all of you and do what? And pray for you constantly. And then again in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, he said, so we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. And then finally in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. Your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. There is no greater responsibility in the church of Jesus Christ than for you to pray for the church and to pray for one another. Now, let me explain to you what that means. When I say pray for one another, I'm not talking about pray for my hangnail. <laughs> I'm not pray I'm not talking about praying for Aunt Susie's stub toe. Those things are all important. We'll pray for those things. But when, when Paul is talking about praying for the church, he is talking about praying for the effectiveness of the church. The church of Jesus Christ is a living, breathing organism. Now, those of you in the medical field can attest to this. A living, strong, healthy organism grows. If it does not grow, something is wrong with it. We heard just this week about that incredible, horrific story from California about the parents who, how can anybody do this, kept their kids chained up. And the 29-year-old weighed 82 pounds. You see, God has called us as a church to be effective. And so what you and I need to do is to pray for one another. Pray that as, as other members of the church are out during the week, that God will give them opportunities to share the love of Jesus, to minister to one another. I heard a great daily prayer. I shared this with our Tuesday morning men's group that, that I've been praying every day, and it's very simple. It simply goes like this. God, today, at the end of the day, let me know that I have loved you more, I have loved your people more, and I have served more than I did yesterday. Imagine if every person, everyone who calls himself a follower of Christ did that, how much of a difference we could make in the world. You know, it doesn't take a lot of money or resources to love God, to love people, and to serve people. Doesn't take a lot. But one thing I know is that no great movement in the church of Jesus Christ, in the movement of Jesus Christ, no great movement has ever occurred unless people were praying. You go all the way back to Acts chapter 2, to the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ. Guess what they were doing in the upper room? Praying and fasting. No great movement. I love the story 
of D.L. Moody. Many of you don't know who he is. He was an, he was an evangelist from, from a century or more ago, and, and he was part of the Great Awakening that took place in our country. Um, but when he would have a stage constructed for him to preach from, he insisted that the stage was built high enough up so that there would be an open cavity underneath the stage so that the leaders that he had and people that were influential would not be out in the audience listening to him. They would be underneath the stage praying for him as the word of God was proclaimed. Anybody under there? <laughs> Last Sunday, we had our leadership team meeting after church. By the way, the leadership team meeting is open to anybody who wants to attend. And we encourage you to. Last Sunday, I handed out the reports that we normally have, and I said, take these, take them home. We're not going to look at them. And we spent about 30 minutes in prayer for our church. No great movement for the cause of Christ has ever occurred unless people were praying. Who are you praying for? Who are you praying for? So, if you're going to share the responsibility of our church, you need to be praying. Secondly, if you're going to share the responsibility of our church, you are going to be willingly inviting those who are not part of the church to attend. Now, let me tell you something, folks. In the world that we live in today, we have so many more opportunities than we've ever had. There are so many ways through social media, through the Internet, through email, so many ways that we can impact people. And I'm afraid that in many ways we're, we're allowing this stuff to be used for evil instead of for good. I remember hearing the story of Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, who started back in the 80s. Um, he believed in using technology to reach people. And, and he was criticized in many ways for some of the things he did. One of the things that really intrigued me that he did, um, how many of you know? remember what a fax machine is? <laughs> a few of you, yeah, most of them, they have, they're in landfills somewhere, rightfully so. But, um, but he decided that he was going to get a list of business phone numbers in his area and use a fax machine. And weekly, he did a Bible study and faxed the Bible study to these businesses. Do you know he was criticized for that? We have so many opportunities. Last week, I made a statement, and someone said to me this week, they actually heard and remembered what I said. Once in a while something clicks. And, and this was the statement that, that deserves repeating. Who will you be responsible for coming to Christ in 2018? Who will you be responsible for coming to Christ in 2018? Imagine if all of us took up the pledge, the promise, whatever you want to say, to pray that God would lead us to be influential in one person's life to come to Christ this year. You know what we would be talking about in January of 2019? That we need to start a second service because we don't have enough room in one service. <clears throat> well... You know, I believe that God never plants a seed without expecting us to have action. So, next Sunday, you can let those who are not here know this. Next Sunday, in your worship guide, there will be, not sure how we're going to do it yet, but a, a slip of paper. And between now and next Sunday, I'm going to ask you to pray to God to place on your heart the name of one person. That you're going to pray for all year long 
that God will bring them to Christ. We're going to write those names down, and we're going to bring them to the altar, and we're going to pray for those people, and then we're going to pray for them continually over the next 12 months. So you've got your challenge. It's not just about intellect. It's about actually doing something. Listen to what the Bible says in Luke 14, verse 23. Jesus said, So his master said, Go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so the house will be full. Why does God want his house, his family to be full? Not so that we can say, wow, we had to start a second service. No, because he needs more parts of the body to proclaim and to fulfill the purpose. That is what he has called us to do. So be ready next week. Finally, today. What? Can you do to share the responsibility of your church? Before I give it to you, I want to tell you that, that all three of these things today come from the depth of my heart. Because these things are key to being who God wants us to be. I want you to think about it for a minute. Praying for people. Inviting people to come to know Christ? How much more basic can you get? Do you have kids or grandkids that you're praying for? That ought to pull at your heartstring just a little bit, huh? Well, the third thing is that when we pray for people and we invite them and we get them here, what do we do? What do we do? Write this down. You warmly, underline warmly, circle it, highlight it, welcome those who visit. Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given the glory. You know, I, as a pastor, I receive so, I'm just inundated sometimes with, with church stuff. You know how it is. You know, if, you, if you're in your business, you're inundated with your business stuff. Well, I get so much stuff from, from church organizations. And I get a lot of uh, information about people who visit churches. I love the ones that say, well, I pulled up to the church, and on the church sign it said, the friendliest church in town. And I walked in, and I wanted to turn around and say, well, that's obviously the first lie I've heard today. <laughs> You see, we, according to Scripture, have been called to warmly welcome those who are honestly and earnestly seeking God into the family of God. So how do we greet people? I want to give you just some basics here. Okay? It's kind of like a 101 on, on greeting people. First of all, with respect and gentleness. Let me tell you that you've got to be sensitive to this, because there are some people who visit a church that the last thing they want is for people to swarm on them. It's just that way. So, so be sensitive. Be sensitive. You know, don't, oh my gosh, we got a visitor. Let's go get them. That's right. Don't, please don't do that. That's right. Because then you cause all kinds of things for me to fix later on. That's right. Or run them on. And please, do not, okay, I want everybody to look, just look on your seats. Look on the, the seat behind you, the, the back of your seat, mm -hmm. under you. There are no name plates there. <laughs> there are no numbers. This is not a ticketed event. So don't you dare go up to somebody that's visiting and say, excuse me, you are in my seat. <laughs> You know what you should do instead? Yeah, you took my You should say, Hey, I see you guys are visiting today. I don't want you to sit by yourself. If you want to, why don't you come sit with me? Wow, what a novel idea. Let's take it a step further. 
Ask him to sit with you and say, oh, by the way, you got any plans for lunch after church? How about if I take you out to lunch? Oh. Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> We've just stepped over the line now. <laughs> now, I know what Tim did now. Now he's getting into our wallets. <laughs> you know what? I tell you what. This, this is dangerous, but I, I, I feel God is good. He's going to take care of if, if you invite somebody to lunch and you can't pay for their lunch, Send me the receipt. Pastor Jay will reimburse you. <laughs> Lisa's not here today, so I can say that. <laughs> She's watching. Here's the deal, guys. Here's the deal. We want people to know that we genuinely care about them. People are hurting. People are searching. And we know the one, we know the one who can meet those needs. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says this, For we speak as messengers approved by God to be what? Entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. Guys, we have been entrusted. You know what that means? God has trusted us with this responsibility. It would be easy for him to just, everybody say. But you know what he chose to do? He said, I'm going to allow those who have come to me to earnestly and gently reach out to those who don't know me. We have been trust entrusted with the greatest responsibility the world has ever known. Now you guys know that I am not, never have been, don't think the Lord will ever call me to this because it's not within my DNA, been a hell, fire, and brimstone preacher. You just, you know that about me. But I want to tell you what I truly believe. That there are people in our lives that are headed straight to hell That's right. because we refuse to open our mouths, we refuse to get involved in their lives, and we refuse to love them the way Jesus would love them. That is exactly what I believe. And that is why we have been given the responsibility and why we should take it so seriously. It's key to being the church that God has called us to be in this modern world. You and me, plus God, make a majority, and we can do this. The question is, will we? Let's pray. Lord, you're so good to us. You're so wonderful. We thank you, Father. We thank you that you have never given us You've never given us instructions without empower us to fulfill the instructions you've given us. <laughs> Folks, as you continue to pray this morning, 